What's up, Flesh and Blood fans? This is Preston with the King's Table, your source for all things budget-friendly Flesh and Blood. Uh, tonight we're going to be taking a look at uh, one of my recent favorite decks that I've absolutely been loving, uh, and that is Kasai the Centauri Sellsword. Uh, so let's go ahead and let's take a look at this $35 deck tech, and we will see how you can uh, slice your opponents uh, to death and throw copper tokens at their face until you win. Uh, so... Because I, Centauri, Centauri Sellsword, uh, as a joke, uh, I'm trying to remember exactly how I worded it, uh, my personal uh, Kasai deck that's in my February account is called She Sells Sellswords by the Seashore, um, I believe is what I've named it, so uh, that's why I got tongue-tied there a second ago, because I'm used to saying that instead of just saying Centauri Sellsword. So let's take a look at this deck. Uh, if you are new to flesh and blood uh or if you uh, haven't really looked at this hero um, and are looking for an opportunity to play it uh, on a budget and you are looking for a way to uh you know still go ahead win some armory games take home some prizes uh and not have to invest a ton of money then uh, this is the deck for you so let's start off by taking a look at the hero herself this is uh, like i said kasai she is a warrior hero uh, pretty standard 20 health and four intellect um, she's got two primary abilities here that are going to be uh, the bread and butter of this deck and how everything operates. Uh, it says your second sword attack each turn costs one less. And we'll look at her swords in just a second to see why that matters. Uh, and then her second ability says at the beginning of your end phase, if you have attacked two or more times with weapons this turn, create a copper token for each weapon attack that hit. Why does copper matter? We will see. There's a, a really specific card in this deck that is Kasai Specialization uh, that is the card that helps you win games and you do uh, or you use copper to do it. So uh, we'll cover that in a minute when we get in the deck, but for now, let's take a look at the equipment. We're going to go ahead and we're going to start with the sabers because we were just talking about her ability in that cost reduction for the second saber. It does cost one less. The beautiful thing is that the sabers that we're running, the Centauri sabers, uh, they only cost one to activate. Uh, they say once per turn action, uh, spend a resource and attack. Uh, they do come in for two, uh, and if they're defended by an attack action card, they'll gain uh, they'll gain an attack uh, point until the end of turn. And so uh, the the whole goal, the whole thing you're looking to do with this deck uh, is to swing with a saber, make sure it has go again, swing with the second saber, and not have to pay anything for that second saber attack. And then uh, obviously you want to buff it because if you just swing for two every time. Probably not going to win the game, uh, but there's lots of ways around that, and uh, we'll cover some some spicy ways to do that here in a minute. But as far as equipment, let's go ahead and talk about uh, some options. Uh, what I like to do for new players or players that are looking to try Hero on a budget uh, is to give you some options, uh, show you some different things to play around with, and see what works best for you, and see um, you know sort of what uh what you like what you uh you know what flows and what helps you play the deck well uh so for headpiece we got a couple different options uh we've got the iron hide helm uh you get to pay a resource when you defend with it to give it plus two uh which is pretty solid in blitz um what i really have enjoyed about playing kasai and blitz is having access to all the warrior equipment that uh has you know pretty solid block values um just really helps increase that survivability uh, and then Helm of the Sharp Eye. Uh, I don't know that the ability is uh, super relevant. I don't know if I've ever even used it playing Kasai. Um, but it does block for one. Um, if you have it, great. Run it. If you have an Ironhide Helm, great. You know, run that. Um, whatever you have access to, right? Because that's, that's the whole thing that we're trying to do. Uh, with these deck techs. We're trying to show you uh, really accessible, low barrier to entry ways to start playing flesh and blood and st and try out the heroes that you are interested in so if you have helm great run it if not you know run the iron hide um you know sure if you get lucky in one of your prize packs that night at, a, at an armory event uh as an uprising pack and you get like a crown of providence or something awesome run that right but uh these are just some really great options to um really just gonna be using them to block and and help live longer uh, for the arm piece, the primary arm piece that we're running is the Gallantry Gold. Uh, fun fact, new players, um, 
you should be able to still get these for fairly cheap in foil and the foil gallantry gold looks really good um but again it's got a you know it's got a block value it's going to help you survive uh and if you have the ability to activate this before you know it, it gets destroyed from blocking or something um which actually it has battle worn so scratch that um it doesn't get destroyed but you can pay a resource destroy the gallantry gold and then your weapon attack gains plus one this turn um and so if you have an extra resource to spend or you have a way to get this off and um you know buff your swords a little bit great uh it's a super solid option to do that but like i said again worst case scenario helps you survive longer in blocks uh for the chess piece uh there's two different sort of approaches you could take to it you could run a blossom of spring Pretty straightforward, just destroy it, gain a resource. Uh, deep blue, uh, this requires a little more thought because you do have to put a card from your hand on the bottom of your deck and then destroy the deep blue and you gain three resources. So um, if you can make the deck function well and you find that this sort of fits into the way that your brain processes these cards and processes these play lines, uh, then great, run deep blue, right? They're both super cheap pieces of equipment. Um, run either... Uh, I think both of them have merit. You just have to sort of test and see which one works best for you. Uh, the piece of equipment that's kind of the non-negotiable in this is the refraction bolters. Um, again, it does have a block value, so it helps you survive. And then when a weapon hits, you can destroy the bolters to give that uh, attack go again. Um, and so we have lots of ways to give your weapons go again uh, in the deck, but um, if, you know circumstances lead to you not having the the you know resources or the cards to do that then you just crack the bolters to go ahead and give it a go again uh and then because the bolters are so important we want to run those all the time uh so if we find ourselves uh you know going against a cano or something we need an arcane barrier uh then we'll just run the null rune robe hood and gloves because everything else you probably survive without um, you know, in that, like, like you said, like Kano matchup or something where Arcane is super relevant. Um, but you'll still want to go ahead and run the refraction bolters for that go again. So let's go ahead and let's actually talk about the deck itself and what we're running. Um, I want to go ahead and we'll break this up into a few different, uh, a few different categories and we'll just sort of go through each card and talk about, um, you know, what they do and why they're valuable. We'll start with our defensive package in this because, it's really just two copies of Sync Below. It's all we're running. Um, the whole point of this is to um, not necessarily play like a glass cannon, but we really want to be aggressive and just swing away with those savers. So we don't want to give a ton of slots in the deck away to a bunch of defensive stuff, um, but having something available um, is still helpful. So uh, just a couple copies of Sync Below, uh, super solid defensive staple. Uh, and it's gonna, you know, it's gonna help when you do have an opportunity to use it um, without disrupting the rest of the deck's game plan. And then uh, we'll go ahead and, um, like I said, that's the only defense reaction. We're only running one attack action in the deck, so we'll just sort of make a pit stop and talk about that right now as well. Um, we're running one copy of Nourishing Emptiness. Uh, this is an incredible card in this deck. Um, because not only does it block for three, um, and it's a, you know, a, a six power attack, uh, for two. Um, but the really important part is its ability. Uh, when there's no attack action cards in your graveyard, which there never is until this hits the graveyard, uh, because we don't run any attack actions in this deck. So this is always going to be online. Nourishing Emptiness has Dominate, and if it hits, your hero gains plus one intellect until the end of turn. Uh, so this, uh, yes, the damage is important. Um, if they don't have any equipment that can block, um, you're still, with this Dominate, going to be able to push some damage through. So that's that's important and that's helpful. Um, but ultimately, uh, what I found the most important thing about this card to be uh, is getting that additional intellect uh, and having access to, you know, one other copy of all these cards that we run in the deck um, can really make the difference for you. So um, having that additional intellect to be able to let you draw another card at the end of that turn can really set you up for a crazy turn uh, next time around. So that's that's why that's in there. Um, it, it's a really great card in this deck. I've had a lot of fun uh, using it and um, it always seems to, uh, even my local play group, uh, they all know that it's in here. 
but every time I play it, it still sort of feels like a surprise. Uh, I think it's a fun little surprise. They don't necessarily agree, but uh, I still throw it in there, and you should too. Uh, so those were sort of the one ofs, um, or sort of the one of uh, type, uh, card type, the defense, reactions, and attack actions. Um, let's go ahead and um, really all that's left in this deck are just actions, non-attack actions, uh, and then reactions. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and I'm going to talk about the actions first, um, and then we'll talk about the reactions and uh, sort of how that all fits together, right? Uh, so with the actions in this deck, um, because one of the fun things about playing Kasai and playing with the two different sabers, because your opponent knows that unless they do something to like really disrupt your turn or you like have a terrible draw or something like that... Um, it's going to be most turns you're going to be swinging with both sabers. So your opponent has to decide which saber is the scariest, right? Is it the first one, the second one, or are they both equally awful? And they need to plan for that. And so attack actions uh, sort of help set up and display to your opponent what is going to be awful and they can kind of see that coming um, but sometimes that can just be to throw in their face and say hey deal with it what do you got how are you going to deal with it um, or it can be to sort of you know divert their attention uh, so that you can do something else uh, later in the turn and that's what i really like about playing kasai is that um, it sort of has uh, some of the the mind game uh, type play that something like you know maybe uh, in Azuri would have or something like that. But um, you know, obviously, like I said, it's you know it's a, it's weapon centric. It's a warrior, uh, and it's done with uh, actions and, and reactions. So let's talk about the actions. Uh, the first one they're running in here: two copies of Dauntless. Uh, it costs one. The next weapon, the, the next weapon attack this turn gains plus three, and the next defense reaction card the defending hero plays this turn costs an additional resource to play. So fine, uh, I'm going to show you that I've got a big sword attack coming. Uh, I'm I'm announcing and broadcasting to you that I'm giving it plus three, but if you want to defend, you know, defense reaction against it, uh, I'm going to make you pay, and and that's a lot of fun because um, even uh, you know going back to the sink below here. Uh, Sink Below is a great card, but even if you had to pay one resource for it, uh, suddenly that changes the way that you approach playing Sink Below depending on what else is in your hand. Uh, so this Dauntless sort of makes your opponent think, how badly do they really want to play those defense reactions? Uh, and then we have, uh, we're running all three colors of Outlane Skirmish. Um, the red one, red and yellow, you're going to be playing more so than the blue. The blue you're mostly going to be pitching, but because, let me pull the red one up here, um, because this is going to help with copper generation, uh, we're running all six colors because even if you have to play a blue one, it's still relevant. Uh, so what this does, it's a, again, like I said, it's an, it's an action, a non-attack action that costs zero. Uh, your next one-handed weapon, so the Centauri Saber, uh, gains plus three. And then, uh, what's really great about Outline Skirmish is this section of text here. This is the next time a weapon attack hits this turn, create a copper token. So, like we talked about, these actions are broadcasting to your opponent what you're going to be doing and how big that sword swing is coming. But it also sets up so that even if they devote all their defensive resources to the first saber, if you give it go again and you can swing with that second saber you're going to have an opportunity to create a copper token if it hits, because um, it just says the next time a weapon attack hits this turn. Uh, so I, I found Outland Skirmish to be incredibly value in that sense, uh, incredibly valuable, because um, it's not just the weapon that gets the buff, it's just the next one that hits. Um, the yellow is going to get plus two, and then the blue is going to get plus one. Again, normally I'm pitching the blue to pay for other things and trying to play the reds and yellows, but even the blue is still valuable. So we got push forward. Uh, this is going to give the next uh, the next attack uh, plus three. And then if you've already attacked with the weapon this turn, then it's going to give 
the next one dominate which fine this is an excellent one if you're going to play be you know be playing this for your second centauri swing um this is great go ahead and announce to your opponent that you're coming in for plus three uh it's going to have dominate if this is the second one and so how much really can they do about it uh well let's find out right and so uh you know the push forward is excellent i've really enjoyed it um like i said even if you're announcing ahead of time that you're going to be buffing that next sword and you're counting on that next attack uh, to be pushing through a lot of damage, it's going to give that dominate, so it doesn't matter. They're going to have to figure something out uh, and not die. Uh, route, or sorry, that is a reaction. Sorry, Sharp and Steel. Uh, so Sharp and Steel, um, this one's pretty simple, straightforward. Just gives the next uh, weapon attack plus three, and uh, it costs nothing. Uh, what you'll also see here, um, just a brief little side note, a lot of these warrior cards are also blocking for three. Um, so if absolutely necessary, you can also play uh, you know, very defensively, and um, you might have more survivability than you'd think until you can set up just the right hand to uh, you know, really push through some crazy sword attacks. Um, but anyway, that's sharp and steel. Uh, just going to give your next weapon attack plus three. Uh, running four copies, uh, two red, two blue of slice and dice. Um, you want to generally be playing the red slice and dice as much as possible. Uh, the blue is still helpful, and I have had plenty of games and plenty of turns where I've played the blue. Um, but again, just like the outlane skirmish, um, maybe the blue is the first thing that gets pitched to sort of pay for other things that you're trying to do in the turn. But either way, um, this one is really great. I really like slice and dice. Uh, in uh, you know in a deck that's running two weapons like the Centauri Sabers, because it's going to give your first one plus one, but it's going to give your second one plus three. Um, so for a zero cost card, um, you're getting those two different buffs, and it still blocks for three. So it's a really solid card in that regard. And um, there's some some crazy combinations you can set up with other cards in this deck uh, to make that second saber just come out of nowhere for way more damage than your opponent thought. Because um, like you look at the saber and it only has two natural attack um and, and so suddenly a couple cards like slice and dice and a few of these others um you know you're gonna be swinging in for you know eight or ten with this saber and your opponent like what what <laughs> so uh again red slice and dice want to try and play um but even uh, just like outlay and even the blue one is still valuable um if that's just what you need to do uh, for your turn uh, and then the last action that we're taking a look at is Kasai Specialization, Blood on Our Hands. So we've talked about copper this whole time, right? Uh, generate copper, generate copper. Uh, why? Well, this is why. Um, blood on Our Hands is a really great card to uh, close out games or to swing things back in your favor if you've had to play maybe defensively for a little bit and you need to take the game back into your hands and sort of take charge and... Um, you know, lead in the direction of closing it out and winning and coming back uh, after having to be on your back foot for a while. Uh, so this is as an additional cost to play blood on our hands, destroy any number of copper you control. Uh, for each copper destroyed this way, choose a mode. There are three different modes and you may choose each mode twice. So at most you'll be destroying six copper tokens. Um, you can give a target one-handed weapon plus one, go again, or allow it to attack twice this turn. Uh, and so you can, uh, I'm, I'm sure you can see even just in, in looking at this card with me and then me saying those things, uh, where Blood on Our Hands has a crazy ability to turn the game uh, in your favor or to close out a game um, with all, in it, because of its flexibility too, um, it really can do whatever you need it to do based on what else is in your hand and based on the current state of the game. Um, so it's a really amazing card. And then let's go ahead and let's uh, talk about reactions now. So we'll just kind of work from the bottom here and work our way back up. Um, and then we'll, uh, after we cover reactions, I'm going to talk about a couple of upgrade options with you. And then uh, we'll look at a couple sample hands and talk about the total cost of the deck. Uh, so the first reaction we're going to look at, we're going to two copies of Glint the Quicksilver. Um, this card is excellent because it's a reaction that costs nothing. Uh, it's one of my favorite pieces of art in all of Flesh and Blood. It gives the target weapon go again. So this is one of the sources we have to give our first saber go again. Uh, and it is uh, unconditional go again, uh, which is even better. Um, 
in a deck like this, I try to avoid cards um, that give uh, or that have a uh, conditional go again, like if the sword hits or something like that, um, because a lot of the other cards in this deck are this deck are so flexible. Um, if you need to make a really strong first saber or a really strong second saber, um, I like to ensure that the go again is unconditional. And, uh, you know, I have the final say in how this turn goes. Um, I, you know, I don't like flipping a coin, right, with, um, you know, having something that says, like, if the weapon hits, it gets go again. Uh, so, Glint the Quicksilver, the reprise ability, and we'll see this in a couple of the attack reactions that we look at. Uh, the reprise ability is that if the defending hero is defended with a card from their hand, um... So just for the sake of sort of speeding things up, uh, anything that has a reprise ability when we talk about later, I'm just going to talk about the effect of if they defend with a card from their hand. Uh, so Glint the Quicksilver, the reprise ability, we get a draw card. Uh, always excellent. There's a lot of stuff in this deck that costs zero or costs one that uh, have some pretty powerful ramifications uh, and some benefits for the swords. So uh, drawing a card is never a bad thing. Uh, we're running one copy of one through, uh, run through, <laughs> one copy of run through. There we go. Uh, it's going to give the target uh, sword go again. Uh, again, that's going to go to the first Centauri Saber. Um, or, you know, maybe the second one if we've got enough cards to set up a blood on our hands to where we can swing multiple times with one Saber. Um, so just keep those possibilities open. But generally... Uh, it'll go to the first Centauri Saber, and then it gives your next sword attack plus two. Uh, and we'll kind of see this with a, the last card we're going to cover in the deck, Blade Runner, up here. Um, I really like things that that are attack reactions that have an effect on the current and on the next. Because um, it makes your opponent sort of like, wait a second, I have to think about all these things at once. And you're just ready to stab them a bunch with a sword. So that's Run Through. You can try it with multiple copies of Run Through. Um, I found that because we're running all the Blade Runners and some of the other things we were going to talk about and have talked about, um, I'm fine with one copy. You can try more. It's, it's no big deal. Uh, this is meant to be a foundation, a budget foundation for you to take it and run with it. Uh, run with it. But I like uh, just one copy of Run Through. Uh, route, this is going to be, um, much like blood on your hands, this is going to be the kind of card that either swings the game back in your favor, if you've been on your back foot for a little bit, uh, or it's going to close out a game. Uh, so it's going to, it does cost two, uh, and it does give your target weapon plus three, but here's the, the reprise ability. Uh, you can return a target non-equipment defending card to its owner's hand. Um, there's nothing better than someone throwing down a card that they've defended with, and you could see that sigh of relief on their face. Uh, I've survived just long enough. I can get to my next turn. I can close out this game, and you throw down a route, and you're like, nah, you're dead. Um, route is so much fun, even uh, with the people I've played Kasai against frequently, just like local play group, and uh, you know uh, Tony from the King's Table as well. Uh, it always feels like a surprise. Even everyone knows it's in the deck, right? Um, but it always feels like a surprise, and it always feels well for me. It feels great to play. Um, so I really, I really like route. It can, it can do some pretty, pretty fun stuff. Uh, puncture. So when we talk about upgrades, um, puncture is on the list of cards that could potentially be cut in favor of some of the other cards that you can add later down the road. Um, but in Blitz, I actually think it has some value. Um, specifically, uh, it's going to give the target sword plus three, but it's also going to give it piercing one, uh, which means it's going to get an additional attack if it's defended by an equipment. Um, you know, Blitz, you've only got 20 life. Uh, Blitz games can be so fast and so swingy. Um, people are going to be really prone to block with their equipment to survive long enough to set up that giant, that giant powerhouse of a turn. Uh, and so Puncture actually does have some merit and some weight in Blitz for that reason. Um, and so if you can't uh, get some of the cards we talk about later in the upgrade section, um, you know, Puncture is a, a totally fair and, uh, you know, viable choice uh, in Blitz. So I really like Puncture. Uh, running four copies of Out for Blood. Uh, the red costs one, gives the target weapon plus three. Uh, blue gives it plus one. And then the reprise ability uh, is that it gives your next a car your next attack this turn plus one um i'll be honest i think uh out for blood is 
uh, is a solid card. That's why it's in here. Um, I think it's uh, one of the ones I play uh, less frequently than some of the other cards. Um, but I I still enjoy the deck and I still run it in my you know quote unquote competitive uh, Kasai. So uh, it's still a good card. Um, and you can sort of experiment much like I've said with everything else, right? Like this is a foundation um, experiment with what you like and what you don't like. Um, I know some people love out for blood, whatever, right? I, I don't hate it. I like the card. Um, I just find myself uh, usually the blue out for blood is one of the first things I pitch to, to pay for other things, but um, it, it can have some really solid effects. And so that's why it is in here. Uh, two reactions to go. Let's talk about iron song response. Um, this just has a reprise ability, and so if, um, you know, it's an attack reaction, but if your opponent doesn't defend with a card from their hand, it doesn't do anything. So, um, it does have the potential, and, you know, it blocks for three and it doesn't cost anything, so it's still a really solid option. Um, you just have to be careful, uh, to know when to play it, because, um, it does have the reprise ability. And then lastly, Blade Runner. This is one of my favorite cards in the deck um, because it does so much setting up for uh, the turn. It's an attack reaction that costs one, uh, and, it, and it gives target one handed weapon um, go again. And so you're going to play this after your first Centauri Saber, generally. You're going to play it after the first Saber attack to give it go again. But then it's going to buff your next Centauri Saber. Uh, the red for three, the yellow plus two, and then the blue plus one. Um, so this is sort of one of the key pieces to making these Sabers work. Uh, I, I love this card. That's why we run, uh, you know, we run all six of them. And uh, this is what sort of allows uh, a lot of the, the great combinations uh, that this deck has access to. So uh, that's the deck super budget friendly option now a couple of the cards actually did go up just a little bit since i made this deck list so um february says we are uh right at about 40 dollars but a lot of this stuff is just like warrior bolt cards that you could probably ask uh, a friend or you know some people in your playgroup at your lgs um really a lot of these cards um are just that bulk price i mean so many seven cents six four four so um is it really going to cost you $40 to acquire all the cards for this deck? Probably not. Um, but this is, you know, we just sort of like this February estimator because it's quick and we can see everything uh, all lined up. Um, let's talk about uh, upgrades really quickly and then uh, we'll do a couple sample hands. Uh, so the first thing that I would do if you can, if you've got, I think they're like nine or 10 bucks usually, uh, the card Spoils of War. This would be one of the very first card uh, that I would purchase to put in this deck. Um, it is a one cost warrior action. Your next weapon uh, attack this turn against plus two and go again. So there's that unconditional go again, right? That's, I almost said unconditional go again, again. Uh, that is what we're looking for. That is what makes this deck work so well. Uh, but also, whenever a weapon you control hits this turn, create two copper tokens uh and so that's every single weapon hit is going to get those two copper tokens um it's absolutely fantastic when you can get that to to work and um you know if you can you know in the first couple turns of the game um you could pretty easily reach uh that i don't, I don't mean like six copper limit as in you can't gain more than six copper but you know, you can only spend basically up to six copper per blood on your hands and so um, you could reach those numbers really easy with some of these cards. So Spoil of War uh, is a great option. Uh, if you want to upgrade equipment, you could look at something like Courage of Bladehold. Um, this is going to have the Temper ability, and it's going to block for two. So it's just going to help you survive longer in the Blitz format. And then you can destroy the Courage of Bladehold to give your sword attacks uh, that cost one resource less. So the Centauri Sabers are free. Um, and if you're going to play a card with a bunch of blood on your hands uh, to give swords the ability to attack more than once, if every single sword can attack for free, then this this is huge, right? Um, and it is just a maj majestic. It's not a legendary. Um, so you can usually pick these up. You know, it's, it's not terrible. Let me... Actually, let me just throw it in. Let me see what Fazbury says. Uh, Courage of Blade Hold. Uh, it's just like 23 bucks, right? So it's not terrible for a really solid piece of equipment. Uh, so I would look at that. Um, 
And then this is just a fun option. And some of you, if you're experienced Flesh and Blood players, are going to see me pull this up and you'll be like, nope, I'm never listening to this guy again. Uh, but I think it's fun. I think it's hilarious. High Striker, if you want to, uh, so this is a generic action that doesn't cost anything. And it says the next time an attack you control hits this turn, create two copper tokens. And it does have go again. Um, you could run two blues to get the higher pitch value and still get some great copper production. Or you could run the red that allows you to create six copper tokens. Which is just absurd. Um, have fun with it, right? Why not? Toss it in. Um, is it like the most competitive and powerful thing in the world? I don't know. Probably not. Um, but... Is it really fun to throw this big mustachioed burly man uh, at a carnival down on the table and create a bunch of copper tokens uh, to make your saber swing for a bunch? Oh yeah, yeah, it's incredible. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So I highly recommend it. Give it a shot. It's a lot of fun. Um, if nothing else, uh, there's a lot of motorcycle driving by. If nothing else, uh, it's just a lot of fun. So let's take a look at a couple of uh, sample hands, give you an idea of how to play out this, uh, you know, this hero, and then uh, we'll we'll wrap up. Um, so let's go ahead, and I'm not going to necessarily pretend like this is turn zero or turn one or anything like that. Um, this isn't a real game, right? This is just meant to sort of show how the cards interact. Um, and what you know you might have access to so the first thing that i see uh when i look at this is that we have a blue out for blood uh so i'm definitely gonna go ahead and uh i'm gonna be probably pitching that honestly um i'll probably i don't i wouldn't want to play both yellow blade runners in one turn i probably want to save one because of that go again um so here's what i'd do i'd probably pitch the blue out for blood uh swing with the first saber depending on if they block or not. Um, maybe I save the puncture, maybe I go ahead and I play it now. Um, but either way, the Blade Runner would definitely get played. Um, so let's say I save the puncture and I just play the Blade Runner. Uh, if they block that out, whatever, great. It's not gonna hit, fine. Um, but we're then gonna play the puncture uh, on the next attack and the buff from this one, that is going to be a total uh, that's going to be a total of 7 for this Saber when it comes in. Uh, potentially 8 if they block with an attack reaction, or an, an attack action card, rather. So, um, again, save the Blade Runner for the next turn. You could arsenal it if you wanted to, uh, draw an extra card, you know, however you want to do that. But um, I hope that just sort of helps to illustrate and begin to illustrate, especially for new players, um, how we would use reactions and how we would sort of gauge what our opponent is doing, like what they're blocking and what they're willing to block and what damage they're willing to take to know whether we should play this reaction on the first saber or the second saber. But either way, we're going to play the blade runner on the first saber to give it go again and then buff the second one. Let's take a look at another hand here. Um, so honestly, um, the sink below uh, the sink below we can save, we can leave alone, just save it for the next turn, uh, to, you know, to block or whatever. Um, I'd probably go ahead and I would, um, we don't have any other source of go again. And if this is only our, you know, second turn or whatever, I guess it would just depend on how far we are in the game. Um, I hate cracking the refraction bolters too early if we can help it. Um, so I would probably want to probably like pitch the puncture, uh, to swing with the first sword, uh, go ahead and glint the quicksilver um, to give that first sword go again. And then if they did block, then we would get to draw another card. And depending on what that card is, um, that could help us buff the next attack. Uh, but so far, that means we've utilized these, these two cards. The next saber is going to be free. So at that point, if we wanted even, um, if we wanted to just save the sink below for later, uh, we could pitch it to pay for the out for blood uh, to buff that second sword. So, you know, those are those are some options uh, that you'd have with a hand like this. Take a look at one more. All right, so this is where we have a route. Okay. Um, so this is probably uh, how I would go about this. I'd start with the outline skirmish, give the first one plus three, and we got to get the top the copper generation online. Um, I would go ahead and I would... Uh, yeah, I'd probably do that. I would go ahead and I would pitch the blue. Um, 
I'd pitch the blue to pay for the first saber. And then here's where you sort of have some flexibility to see how your opponent responds. If they, let's say you just want to get the copper and you just want to push the damage through, because remember we'll have two floating resources for this. Um, if they block it out, or maybe they do a really good job of defending it, um, maybe we don't want to play the route. Maybe we want to save the route for later, which is uh, totally a fine option. Um, then you could save the route for later, and you could just pay for the run-through to give the first one go again, and then to go ahead and swing for free with the second one, and hopefully at some point get one of those to hit to get the copper from the outland. Um, or if they're just blocking one card from hand and you really just want to have some fun with them and push some damage through, then um, you could use the floating two resources to pay for the route, and then if it hits, crack the refraction bolters, and then uh, swing at the sword just as some extra bonus damage for free. So um, there's just a couple of sample hands. I hope that sort of, like I said, begins to illustrate what's possible with this deck. Um, I hope that this was helpful, uh, whether you're a new player uh, looking to pick up Kasai or whether you're an existing player who just wants a, a really cheap option uh, to try the hero before you invest in it too much. I really hope this was helpful. Uh, Kasai is an incredible deck. When I first started playing Flesh and Blood, um, I wasn't big on uh, weapon-centric heroes. Um, but the more I play Kasai, the more I just absolutely love the deck. So um, I hope that you do too. Um, as always, um, you know, like, follow, subscribe, all that that fun YouTube stuff. Uh, definitely uh, connect with us on Twitter at kingstablegames. Or not .com. It's on Twitter. Kings Table Games. Um, and, you know, we love talking about Flesh and Blood. We love talking about uh, getting new players involved. We love, um, you know, talking and discussing budget options. So, um, as always, uh, definitely go ahead and chat some Flesh and Blood with us. Um, I hope you have an absolutely wonderful whatever time of the day you're watching this video. And, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's it for King's Table today. Have a wonderful rest of your day, evening, morning. And uh, we can't wait to see you again for another budget deck tech.